It was Mr. Weston's custom every afternoon, as soon as he was drunk, to hear his daughter play on the harpsichord, for he was a great lover of music, and perhaps had he lived in town might have passed for a connoisseur, for he always accepted against the finest compositions of Mr. Handel. He never relished any music but what was light and airy, and indeed his most favourite tunes were Old Sir Simon the King, St. George he was for England, Bobbing Joan, and some others. His daughter, though she was a perfect mistress of music and would never willingly have played any but Handel's, was so devoted to her father's pleasure that she learnt all those tunes to oblige him. However, she would now and then endeavour to lead him into her own taste, and when he required the repetition of his ballads, would answer with a, Nay, dear sir, and would often beg him to suffer her to play something else. This evening, however, when the gentleman was retired from his bottle, she played all his favourites three times over without any solicitation. This so pleased the good squire that he started from his couch, gave his daughter a kiss, and swore her hand was greatly improved. She took this opportunity to execute her promise to Tom, in which she succeeded so well that the squire declared if she would give him t'other bout of old Sir Simon, he would give the gamekeeper his deputation the next morning. Sir Simon was played again and again till the charms of the music soothed Mr. Weston to sleep. In the morning, Sophia did not fail to remind him of his engagement, and his attorney was immediately sent for, ordered to stop any further proceedings in the action, and to make out the deputation. Tom's success in this affair soon began to ring over the country, and various were the censures passed upon it, some greatly applauding it as an act of good nature, others sneering and saying, No wonder that one idle feller should love another. Young Bliffil was greatly enraged at it. He had long hated Black George in the same proportion as Jones delighted in him, not from any offence which he had ever received, but from his great love to religion and virtue for Black George had the reputation of a loose kind of a fellow. Bliffle, therefore, represented this as flying in Mr. Allworthy's face, and declared with great concern that it was impossible to find any other motive for doing good to such a wretch. Thwackham and Square likewise sung to the same tune. They were now, especially the latter, become greatly jealous of young Mr. Jones with the widow, for he now approached the age of twenty, was really a fine young fellow, and that lady, by her encouragements to him, seemed daily more and more to think him so. Allworthy was not, however, moved with their malice. He declared himself very well satisfied with what Jones had done. He said the perseverance and integrity of his friendship was highly commendable, and he wished he could see more frequent instances of that virtue. But Fortune, who seldom greatly relishes such sparks, as my friend Tom, perhaps because they do not pay more ardent addresses to her, gave now a very different turn to all his actions, and showed them to Mr. Allworthy in a light far less agreeable than that gentleman's goodness had hitherto seen them in.' 